Hello, I am here uh, with Dory, my, my mentor, class artist, class everything. <laughs> she knows a lot about class uh, and is uh, well known in the, you know, the glass casting world and glass music world uh, for her works uh, with you know, glass imagery and casting projects and, and, and all the like. So right now I'm, I'm seated with Dory at the Chinese Sparkle Studio which is um, the studio facility that she and her business partner, Matthew De Perez, operates. Uh, they opened in 2021. July 2021. July 2021. Um, and they've been working on a lot of projects for various artists and architects. Um, it's mainly, you know, fabrication, but they also teach classes here sometimes, and, and they want to, I think, get into that more, uh, you know, if they expand their facility. So. I'm, I'm seated with Dory now, and I have a few questions for her, for you. <laughs> I feel like I'm like <laughs> telling this to... <laughs> so, um, my first question, uh, we're going to go to like the beginnings. Uh, when did you realize you wanted to study art in general? So, my dad was a graphic designer, and so I was always around artists all my life. And I pretty much knew from a child that I wanted to do art. I didn't know what capacity it was going to be, but... I pretty much always knew that I was going to be doing art in some way, maybe teaching, basically. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And um, then getting into glass, um, how and when did you realize you wanted to pursue glass in particular? So two towns over, which was, you know, pretty. There was a glass studio called Glass Impact, and my dad knew that I was always making and painting and drawing and, um, you know, just making doll clothes and things like that. So he was like, maybe you'd like this studio. I was 17 years old. I was uh, just turning 18. It was November. Um, yeah. And I went to do a flame working class. So it was a two day feed workshop working on a bench top torch. And then they also had stained glass there. So I was kind of hanging out and just seeing what that was because I didn't really know how stained glass worked. And then down below it was like an open uh, floor plan that uh, they had glass blowing in the basement. So you could overlook and, and watch them blow glass. So after my bead making class, uh, I think I took one other weekend workshop. So I had, you know, four days under my belt. And then I was like, I want to do that. So um, I started blowing glass after that when I was 18. Because technically you had to be 18 at the studio. I see. So. And so, so now, now that you um, primarily cast, at least here, <laughs> yeah. um, like where, where did you start to cast? Where did you find that? And like, can you tell me about when you, when you decided to pursue cast as, as casting, glass casting as, as your primary, you know, source of income and livelihood? Yeah. So, uh, if anybody has seen glass blowing before, you can tell that it's probably a very expensive material because they have these huge crucibles which melts the, the batch or the sand of glass and that has to be charged at 2,150 degrees and it has to be held there for, you know, uh, basically indefinitely. So that takes a lot of energy. There are electric furnaces, but really gas furnaces are the ideal because it can get really like viscous. Um, so extremely expensive. You always need to have uh, an assistant, not always, but for the most part. And so in school, I realized, it dawned on me that being in school was kind of a great place to learn how to explore glass blowing, but anything after that in the real world was going to be very expensive and not really much as doable. So uh, when I was an undergrad, I was assisting a grad student. He was a Venetian glass blower, and we were talking about things, and he was familiar with my work because he was my teacher, and he said, actually, you'd really love my wife. She does flame working. And I was like, oh, I've done a little bit of that a long time ago. And then she also does casting. Okay. So then she became adjunct at Illinois State University where I was going to school. And so then she started showing techniques in, in casting. So uh, with casting, it's very hands-on. It's process-oriented. It's very singular in a lot of ways. So I kind of started diving into that, realizing in the bigger picture of things that this was more financially doable once I got out of school because I don't have a trust fund, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, so I really just kind of followed her, and then um, she pointed me into the direction. There was other schools where I could TA and do things in the summertime to learn from other film casters and film formers, and that's kind of how I, I really decided to do that. Cool. And you, 
tell me a lot about uh, college as, as like a way to explore glass. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your college experience? Like how was college for you? It was, it was good. Um, I actually, I transferred in with my associates. I ended up staying in Illinois where uh, I'm from. I uh, got my associates because I had a full scholarship there and then I transferred. So I had a little bit of a different experience than most people because going to a four-year school, a lot of those kids had already been in the dorm with each other for right. two years. So I felt like a little bit of an outsider, but um, that was one thing that um, maybe felt like a little bit off, but the glass studio was way far away off of the art campus. It was in its own, it used to be a sheet barn actually. It was next to the football field. So that alone kind of already made me feel a little bit better that, you know, it wasn't just like art kids, art kids, that I had missed out on something. So, um, yeah, that was, it was a good experience though as far as, um, you know, being able to experience like a little like survey. So we were able to do a little glass blowing, casting, and flame working. Um, but my teacher was mainly a glass blower. And at some point when he realized I was really interested in casting, um, he basically said, I, I can't help you anymore, oh. but I'll, I'll help you like, write scholarships and recommend you for things so you can learn from other people. So. Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, and like within your college career, uh, is there like a favorite project you worked on or, or like favorite um, collaboration that you did um, or a favorite professor that, that you worked with? Uh, just like any favorite. Yeah. So definitely i had a lot of great uh professors they all kind of had their own unique flavor uh, john miller was the main professor he still is he's tenured at illinois state and so he always had really great energy because he understood that we're all learning this really difficult medium and so even when we were doing the wrong thing he would always you know like make us not feel bad about what we were doing wrong but you know just say it in a way that we do understand and he was um, kind of a, a, a joker or a clown too so he made it a fun experience and then Carmen Lozar uh, was really my main mentor I actually ended up being the nanny for their children later okay. in life um, and then Amy Rupert she was actually had a ceramic background and she's the one that taught me decals oh cool so um, yeah so that was really fun they all brought you know a lot a lot of flavor but I think my favorite assignment was we had to do a project on heaven and hell and I ended up making I was really into like the shrunken head culture like voodoo yeah, stuff yeah. so I ended up slumping the space and then drilling holes like where the eyes and the nose and the mouth was and then I sewed it shut oh, cool. and um, in my presentation I was like this is both like a heaven and hell because there was also a kid in our class that was deaf which is really interesting to communicating because everything is so verbal. Um, but I was saying that or we had been having this discussion that, you know, my my hell would be not being able to see or talk or hear. And he was like actually having a different experience and not being able, you know, to hear and talk is actually kind of like heaven to me. That's so, so that's yeah, kind of how it was like a. a, a the two-in-one type back, of thing, back. but he, I wouldn't have been able to get to that unless I did have, like, have that conversation with him. So right. that was really a lot. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, and now transitioning to like, you know, other art. Um, if you couldn't practice class, if class wasn't a thing, what what would you do artistically or not even artistically? Like it, if uh, you know, as a reflection, if you couldn't practice art, what would what, you, what do you see yourself doing? Oh my goodness. If I couldn't practice art, I would probably, which is still, still art. I would probably be a seamstress. Okay. Uh, I was a seamstress at David's Bridal after school, um, so I probably want to do that. But I would be probably something to do with the skin. Okay, like a dermatology. Of yeah, the something like that. I cool. Think. Or maybe a dentist. <laughs> Probably dermatology, though. I, I can see dentistry being. Yeah. yeah Actually, I was going to be a mortician because my oh, family owns okay. a funeral home, so oh, that's really? another. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell me about your largest failure in in class? Oh boy, there's so many. Is there any any one that that you want to share? I mean, across the board, that was most common. I was horrible about. 
about documentation. I mean, I'm quite a bit older than you, so the phone camera things weren't really happening. Right. Um, so all of my work getting broken or I gave it away before, um, before I documented it. That was a failure of mine. Um, and as far as like kiln crashing, oh man. I would say just probably a mold breaking open and then landing on the bed of the floor and not really knowing to lay down sand because I was still learning. Oh, okay. And so you have to like chisel that away and it hurts the teacher and the kiln <laughs> as you're doing it, but that's all part of learning. So. I see. Um, let's see. Uh, and then regarding the teachers, um, who was your like main source of inspiration or encouragement in your career? I would say Carmen Lozar, for sure. She was actually, I mean, teachers don't make any money at all, and she was using her own money to give to me to go to Corning and Pilchuck and places so I could study further. So I would say that's that would be, yeah. That's great. And, and so uh, regarding the places where you have studied further, like, mm -hmm. you know, what have you done? Uh, and, like, is there any, you know, certain program that you did that, that you want to share? I would say um, there's a lot of non-degree um, uh, schools that end up being kind of like adult uh, camp, class camp, um, but it, people from all over the world attend, and so really, because I've been doing this for 22 years, I'm still working with people that are still in the field. A lot of them, like everybody that I graduated with, I think only two of them are still doing glass within my, my class. Um, oh, okay. So what, what, what tends to happen to them? Um, it's just, what, it's just yeah. too expensive. I know one guy ended up going into music. I'm still friends with him. Another one manages a Starbucks. Uh, I think the other two just went into uh, teaching art in general. Um, but yeah, okay. I think you really have to have a passion because it is a really difficult material yeah. that you have to keep having the drive. Otherwise, it's but, um, but as far as uh, classes go, I did go to Germany um, and met my idol. I had never met him before. He was 92 at the time. And um, he was making glass work in a way that I saw when I very first started working glass that totally changed my life because I just didn't know you could work in that manner. And so I got to meet him uh, about five or six years ago. He just passed away. But... Um, you know, going to just other communities that everybody everybody has the same interests, and then you bond over this, and then you just become friends for life. So I would say build work in Germany, Corning Museum of Glass in Corning, New York, Pilchuck uh, in Washington State, and Penland School of Craft, Haystack in Maine. There's a lot of amazing oh, places. Yeah. They're like all dreamy in their own special way. Right. Yeah. Nice. And I, I won't ask you to pick a favorite. Um, uh, Thank you. Because <laughs> I know that that would be difficult. Yeah. Um, so, I guess I'm curious to know, like, do you have any, like, funny stories of your glass career? I remember you telling me one about, like, a, a, a glass piece that, like, dripped in the kiln and then you, you submitted yeah, the drip. Yeah, yeah. You, but, like, do you have anything yeah. like that or that you could tell? Yeah. Like, just anything. Um, so... I was kind of getting back at somebody, which was really childish at the time, but uh, I was teaching a kiln casting class, and this was still at Illinois State, and I uh, had this drip that was, if you were a caster or knew much about glass, you knew it would be trash, and then there was um, uh, anybody in the art that was uh, major could submit anything and so I had this glass trash that I put his name on and it actually got submitted and then it won first place <laughs> so he actually won an award for this glass trash and it was called suspended in time and yeah I'll never forget that but it was actually in the bigger picture I was like I said it was a childish thing to do but the grad students were really upset because obviously they were working really hard right. And this person won money, and they were like, why did you do that? This was really an opportunity that somebody that was serious could uh, you know, make, make that happen. Right. But I think the other big thing, too, was saying that my glass blowing teacher was almost
almost like a clown in so many ways. So he would always like bring candy and whatever, and in the hot shop, this is a very Italian tradition, is cooking in the hot shop. Okay. So on Thanksgiving, we would cook a turkey in our annealer, um, but we'd also like put Twinkies in the uh, reheating chamber and just see like how long it would take for things to not look like that thing anymore. Right. And so Doritos and Twinkies really, and Oreos, they kind of stay the same really? for a while. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, and that's over 2,000 degrees. Yeah. So anyway, that was a fun little game that we played that my teacher was totally on board with. Yeah, that, that's hilarious. Yeah. Um, okay, so so now we're sitting in Shiny Sparkle Studio. It's, it's, it's a little um, you know, glass casting facility in Red Hook. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the inception of this studio and, yeah. and like how um, you and your business partner Matthew decided to do this? Yeah. And also like after that you could maybe tell me about how you met Matthew? Yeah, actually I, I met Matthew at Illinois State. So we've been friends for a very long time and we kind of both did our own things um, and somehow ended up in Brooklyn around the same time. I was here first. He was in Australia for a couple years on a Fulbright and he was ready to leave and so he had called me and we had talked about it and he figured that this would be a good place to land. So we had always stayed friends and in contact, but um, you probably know this now, but in the, the glass scheme of things in Brooklyn, everybody's pretty much a glass blower. So um, being a kiln pastor, a kiln former, I had a lot of work. I was mainly working out of urban glass. And, you know, it's a little bit difficult because it is half education and half renter for fabrication. And so it was really hard to fabricate things because, you know, the kilns break down with the steam and there's that fire scale once the elements get rusty. And, you know, when you're working on, you know, major things for people in galleries, you can't have that kind of stuff. So I already knew that that was already getting a little bit frustrating for me. Um, and um, then COVID happened. And so that was a really scary time because I figured, well, nobody's going to want glass anymore. It's just kind of this, like niche market but that actually wasn't the case so I came back from the Midwest um, after you know six months and then I started getting emails with lighting and all these kinds of you know fabrication projects and so Matthew and I talked about it and we're like well you know if COVID were to happen again and these studios close then we wouldn't have any place to make work and on top of it it was already hard to make work because of you know, education and renting kiln space and time. So we kind of went out on a limb and started looking at spaces just to see what, you know, the price for square footage and what that would look like. Obviously, we need a lot of power for the kilns. So we looked at a couple places and he was already living in Red Hook and our friend who's an architect in this building, she said, oh, well, this is a really huge building space. Why don't you just talk to Brian and Suzanne and, and see what they can offer you? So technically, we took two units that they built for us and so that's kind of how it, it started and then I simultaneously moved to Red Hook knowing that this was going to be a thing but they had to build this out so it took about three months for them to build the walls and get all the skylights in and everything and yeah and so then we started moving in July of 2021. Nice. So yeah. And, and uh, I know you, you're about to go um just one more question just to end on a high note mm -hmm. um like what have been your favorite projects here oh my goodness hmm i would say they all have been very very challenging um which for me my favorites are the things that probably push me the most um and as of right now the ivana piece was really challenging but ended up being my favorite because of that outcome cool. so which was melting um, different um, batches of glass in a specific form and then slumping it but figuring out how to slump it, it yeah it, it took a lot of work yeah, and a lot of challenge but um, and then also seeing the client super happy with the piece so that also makes you feel good so. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking you. about so your, happy you here. your career. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Yep, you've um, been awesome. Amazing. Well, thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>